I'm going to talk about the role of the oceans in, in climate. This is a beautiful image of, uh, of uh, clouds over the Pacific, and it just reminds us that uh, uh, there's a lot of ocean on the planet. You know, 70% of the ocean of the planet is covered by, by the ocean. And the, and the ocean's important in, in climate for at least three reasons. The first is that it's a big buffer of climate change. So it's exchanging heat and carbon with the atmosphere, but it's got a huge heat capacity. And so it's buffering climate change. If it weren't for the ocean, we'd be warming up a lot faster than we are at the moment. Uh, the second thing is that water can, of course, change state and uh, become ice. Ice is very reflective. And so it, it, it plays a big role in the planetary albedo, uh, which is regulating the uh, global temperatures of, of the Earth. And the third thing is that the oceans are fluid. It moves around, and it's carrying properties around the globe, and particularly carrying heat uh, around the globe. Now, one of the things you can notice here is that there's a band of cloud north of the equator. This is uh, known as the intertropical convergence zone. It's the, it's the place where we get an, a, a maximum in tropical precipitation. Uh, David McGee showed us a picture of this. And it's actually north of the equator in the annual mean. And uh, the, the ocean uh, plays an important role in, in setting this interhemispheric asymmetry in, in, in climate. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the way the the, the ocean uh, uh, sets up regional large-scale patterns of climate. So I'm going to start by talking about um, the uh, oceans and asymmetry of climate and noting that the northern hemisphere is warmer than the southern hemisphere in, in the current climate. So this shows the uh, asymmetric temperature distribution. This is the component of the of, of, of temperature, which is uh, asymmetric about the equator from, based on observations. So this is the uh, equator, uh, and we're going up in the atmosphere here. This is like 10, 15 miles up in the atmosphere. This is uh, at, the, at the surface. Uh, this is the atmosphere, and this is the ocean. So you can see that the northern hemisphere troposphere is two or three degrees warmer than the uh, southern hemisphere troposphere. And the northern hemisphere ocean is warmer, slightly warmer than the southern hemisphere uh, ocean. And what, what we think is happening, what we know is happening, is that the ocean is actually carrying heat from the southern hemisphere and moving it into the northern hemisphere. So that warms up the, uh, uh, the northern hemisphere troposphere. So the ocean carries heat across the equator, warming the northern hemisphere. Um, the, uh, the, uh, another big asymmetry of climate is that there's a, a much more ice over Antarctica than there is over the Arctic. So there's two miles of ice around Antarctica, um, whereas the, uh, the Arctic ice is much less extensive and, the, and, the, uh, and we think might be quite vulnerable as, as climate changes. I don't think we should worry about Antarctica losing all its ice. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, big chunks of ice might break off and drop into the ocean, but it, it's going to be there. Now, one of the, one of the um, roles that the ocean plays is that it thermally isolates Antarctica from the rest of the glo uh, climate system um, but because of it, there's a circumpolar current moving around the southern hemisphere um, through Drake Passage. And, and that thermally isolates uh, the Antarctica, enabling ice to build up. That's, a, that's another important role that the ocean plays. Um, third uh, aspect is the intertropical convergence zone. This band of uh, excess precipitation, uh, this band of precipitation, is slightly north of the equator. This horizontal line uh, is the equator and this is the annual mean precipitation in millimeters per day. It's slightly north of the equator. So the, equator, the, the uh, uh, axis of symmetry of, of climate is not at the equator, it's slightly north. And if we go into the atmosphere here, this is the equator uh, moving up into the atmosphere. These are the Hadley cells 
And the, there's rising air in, in this convergence zone, which leads to all the precipitation. And uh, the Hadley cell is not, the, the rising is north of the equator and, and it moves uh, southwards. And this cell actually carries energy from the northern hemisphere into the southern hemisphere. So uh, the, the atmosphere is trying to equilibrate its hemispheric temperatures, and it does that by shifting uh, the axis from the equator north. Um, uh, another important asymmetry is that the Atlantic sector is warmer and saltier than, than, the, than the Pacific. So here, this is the surface salinity, uh, a departure from the zonal mean. And the, and the yellow areas are places where tell us that the Atlantic is saltier than the Pacific. And this has a really important part of, uh, this is a really important part of today's climate because salty water is heavier, uh, more dense than uh, fresh water. And so you get in the ocean a big convective overturning cell, which we, we know at the ocean conveyor belt, in which uh, we get sinking. This is a, a, a section through the uh, ocean. This is the equator north, south. This is the top few kilometers of the ocean. We get a great big overturning cell emanating from the North Atlantic, um, which carries warm water across the equator. And uh, it, we get cooling here, and it returns to the uh, uh, depth. This carries energy from the southern hemisphere into the, north, into the northern hemisphere and, and plays a role in this, in this asymmetry. So these are these gross, large-scale, interhemispheric and zonal asymmetries of, of climate. The ocean is playing a, a critical role in, 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 this, uh, in, in these patterns. So what I want to do is, you, might, you may think this is a bit of a bizarre thing to do, but I am an oceanographer. So what I'm going to do is actually try to build a, um, a, a cartoon of the climate system. I'm, I'm going to try and build a system which uh, starts very simply, and, and I put in a little bit more complexity until I get something that looks quite a bit like the real climate. And I'm going to start off by just having thinking about a world in which there were no land at all. So I'm going to look at the climates of water worlds and what would the climate of the Earth be like if there were no land uh, around? So here, uh, here is our, this world. There's no land. Um, there's an atmosphere, an ocean, the possibility of ice, but, uh, but, but no land. And um, that's, that's a, a simple system that you can think about. Um, but one of the things that... The, that we see, that one of the things about the ocean is that it's in ocean basins, so it's, it's constrained geometrically uh, by, by coasts. And so the ocean can't move in arbitrary paths. There are geometrical and rotational constraints on, on ocean circulation, rotation meaning Earth's rotation. So we can put this kind of information into this system by introducing barriers. So I'm going to consider an aquaplanet, which is a pure aquaplanet. It, 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 it's, um, it's, it's an ocean which is a few kilometers deep with a flat bottom and no land. And then I can introduce a ridge, which, which is a barrier going from the North Pole to the South Pole. And look, look, look to see how the climate changes if I stick a ridge into the system. And then I can open up uh, this is this. I can open up a Drake Passage by uh, by putting a gap in in the uh, 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 in, in the barrier, or I can have. This is my most realistic simulation. I I have a double Drake, which is. Um, but I actually get something that looks quite a lot like the real world. Um, I I have a double Drake, which is a, a, a small basin, i.e. the Atlantic, and a large basin, which is the Pacific. So I'm going to I'm going to do this numerically. Um, I'm going to explore this with a series of numerical simulations of these highly idealized water worlds and see if I can build up something that looks a bit like the real world. Um, so here's my aquaplanet simulation. Um, on the left, um, we have the temperature at 500 millibars in the atmosphere, which is about five miles up. The red areas are warm, the cold uh, 
uh, the blue areas cold. These are our weather systems and synoptic systems in, in the numerical simulation. Warm air tends to be moister than uh, cold air, so the whites are uh, the humidity and cloud, cloudiness in the atmosphere. So we have more moisture in the tropics, less over the, over the uh, poles. And we integrate this system out for 5,000 years. Uh, it's blowing over the ocean, and the, ocean, the, the ocean's moving around, and we're getting a coupled simulation. So this is day 300. We have to integrate a long time because the ocean's a bit like an elephant. It, it kind of remembers things for a long time. You ha it takes thousands of years to mix itself up. So, um, uh, so in the pure aqua planet, if we do this simulation, um, we end up with, uh, uh, with two ice caps, one over the over the northern hemisphere and one over the southern hemisphere. This is sea surface temperature in, in the climatology of this simulation. I've got an ice cap here and an ice cap there on my pure aqua planet. And the reason for this is that the ocean, it, because, because the Earth's spinning round, there are angular momentum constraints on it, so the ocean kind of moves along in zonal currents. And it's, it can't get energy to the poles very easily. And so we get these big ice caps. But now if I put a, if I put a ridge in the system that uh, connects one pole to the other, what do you think happens? The ridge is an assist, and it enables the, the ocean to move energy to the poles. And so what happens is that we get no ice caps in this system. So the, the, the ice goes away in, in this system in which we, we we, um, we, we have a, a, a barrier going from one pole to the other. Well, what happens in the, in the Drake simulation? Can you imagine what might happen? You get, a, you get an Antarctic ice cap and no Arctic ice cap. So, um, so in this way, we're able to, to, to build up this very important interhemispheric asymmetry in climate, i.e. the southern hemisphere is colder than the northern hemisphere, and there's a great big ice cap over Antarctica and uh, no ice cap in, in, in this particular simulation with, with the Drake. You can go further and look at, again at the Drake minus ridge to get the inter, and look at the interhemispheric asymmetry in, in, in temperature. And this is the uh, as, asymmetric temperature distribution. It's warm in the northern hemisphere and and cold in the southern hemisphere. And what the ocean's doing in this Drake minus ridge is it's carrying energy. The, 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 the ocean is carrying energy from the southern hemisphere into the northern hemisphere. And it's actually carrying it up gradient. It's carrying it from cold places to warm places. The reason it can do this is that it's mechanically forced. It's not working like a heat engine. It's mechanically forced. And so it can actually carry energy up the heat, uh, up the temperature gradient. And the atmosphere is moving energy from the northern hemisphere into the southern hemisphere. And it does that by shifting the ITCZ north of the equator. I, I don't have time to show you this, but the intertropical convergence zone, this band of cloud and excess precipitation, is actually north of the equator in this, uh, in, in this uh, model. Um, and if I compare that with the um, if I compare that with the observations, there are some broad similarities be between the two. Um, so uh, now the, the high end of this uh, hierarchy of, of, uh, of, of, of models is, is this double drake. So now I do the same kind of calculation, but I have a, a small basin and a large basin. And, um, and, and so uh, what, what happens now is very interesting. You, that, uh, so what happens is, so this is the moisture uh, field in, the, in, in, in this simulation. And, and what happens is that the, the ocean tickles the atmosphere, so you get more weather systems being formed in this, in, over the small basin, because there are, there are sea surface temperature anomalies associated with the boundary currents. So the storm track in the atmosphere gets organized. You get evaporation of water from the ocean in the small basin and it carries it zonally across and dumps it as, as water over the large basin. So the large basin gets fresh, and the, the small basin gets salty. And, um, 
And, and what, what we then see is that the, the salty water is denser than, than uh, fresh water, and so you get convection in the ocean and an overturning cell, this conveyor belt, which ends up being confined to the small basin. And so you get this, you get something that looks really quite a lot like the, I mean, if you, if you kind of take a bird's eye view of this, it looks quite a bit like the, the, the present climate. Um, and uh, you can go further and look at the heat and fresh water transport in this, in this system. So uh, this is the meridional energy transport um, in, uh, as a function of, of, of uh, latitude. This is the equator moving northwards. This is in the small basin. So this is the transport of energy across the equator from the south to north, which is in petawatts. This is an order 10 to the 15 watts per meter watts going across the equator. This is the large basin. This is the freshwater transport. I don't have time to go into these details. But now if I compare this to the observations, this is the actual observed transport from data or inferred from observations. There's a striking similarity between the two, which tells us that really uh, the land doesn't really matter in this regard. Actually, it does matter to some degree. But we've been able to, in a cartoon-like fashion, we can construct a world that looks a little bit like our present by just having a few sticks in the, in the ocean. Um, now, th this aquaplanet ha exhibits multiple equilibria. This is a really fascinating thing. And it, it gets back to uh, some of the uh, work that David McGee was reporting on, um, that the Earth has been in many different states. It's been in hot houses. It's been in glacial. We've been in glacial climates. We've been maybe even in a snowball 800 million years ago. And uh, the remarkable thing is that, that both the ridge world and the aqua planet um, exhibit multiple equilibria in the sense that if we use the same forcing, the model, we can, we can maintain three different climate states. One which is warm, one which is which, a glacial state, and a snowball where, where the, the whole planet uh, um, uh, freezes over. And these are, the, the, these are multiple equilibria in the sense that You've got a ball rolling around a, 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 a corrugated surface, and there are equilibrium states. So one of the one of the questions that one might ask is, could Earth flip into another state? Um, are multiple equilibria a way of thinking about past climates? Have I got zero minutes? Yeah. Um, so uh, so c good conclusions. Um, so. <laughs> Studying the climate of these aqua planets is fun. I've become ab obsessed by it. For, uh, uh, and and I, I, I'm now reluctant to put land into the system. Um, um, it, it informs us about the elemental role of the ocean in climate. So we can think of this progression as a cartoon of the, of the, cli of, of, of the climate. Um, if I wanted to draw a cartoon, what would the essential things be about the present climate? So it, it would be interhemispheric asymmetries, geometrical ones, and zonal asymmetries. We can also think about it as an evolution over geological time. You know, as the plates move around the world, um, you know, you, you, we, we move into we, 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 the tectonics drives the land into these uh, into this evolution. There are many, many unanswered questions. Do multiple equilibria of Earth's climate exist? They do in the in, in this model. Uh, if so, how stable are they? And we we can also use these kind of calculations as a framework for thinking about the dynamics, say, of exoplanets. We've been working with Sarah on on these uh, matters. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to finish off by thanking lots of people who, who over the years have been working on these, kind of, on these kind of problems. This is a very high resolution simulation of an aqua planet. So this is what the ocean would look like if, if North America were, uh, were shrunk to a, I've got to stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.
feels like an AGU meeting and a convener here. And this is exactly why the geologists and the oceanographers love each other in our department. <laughs> Looking at the rocks. But your sticks, of course, are the continents and they move all about. So it's, yes, it's, yeah, all, it's all about land. Yes, and yes, yeah. <laughs> anyway, one question and then we have to move on. Victor Starr's main contribution to the dynamics of the climate was that most of the interesting energy motions are uh, upgraded. He summarized that in the book he wrote on the physics of negative viscosity phenomena. Yes. You said that you had to put in a ridge in order to get upgrading transports, but you don't. And then the, what Victor Star said is you can get those anyway. Now the ridge may help it, yes. but it isn't necessary. Okay, so the question was, um, uh, can, can, can uh, momentum is transferred up gradient. Victor Starr was talking about momentum. I'm talking about heat. The atmosphere uh, takes heat down gradient. Uh, it's thermally driven, and it can, do th it, can, it, it can transfer momentum up gradient. And Victor Starr realized that. Not, not always, but Victor Starr understood that. Uh, the ocean can actually transport heat up gradient because it's mechanically forced. That's a, that's a different thing. <laughs>